Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. Um, I'm Erica Serena. Um, as Lindsay described, I work as a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, it was my first real job when I was 15. Uh, I'm now 28. I'm working as a photojournalist, and my focus is issues relating to environment and human interaction. Um, so I still rehab wildlife, um, just not in the clinic anymore, and now I'm focusing more on the um, journalistic side, but I'll describe that in a little bit, why I did that. Um, but yes, tonight you're going to learn all about what it's like to be a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, <laughs> so let's get started. So what is wildlife rehabilitation? Well, if you're here, you probably love wildlife, which, you know, like me, that's something that um, we all have in common, most of us. And when we see an animal in need of help, so perhaps it's sick, it's injured, um, it's orphaned, perhaps like a, a baby animal, um, and we want to return those animals to the wild um, as healthy as they can be so that they can go and live natural lives um, as the wild creatures they are. So, you know, you find a baby squirrel, you raise it to adulthood, release it, and then they can go and live their life. Um, so basically, we are the nurses of the wildlife world. Um, who's a wildlife rehabilitator? Well, that's me getting my hair eaten by a duck. Um, anyone can be a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, as long as you love animals and you have a good um, motivation for doing it, um, I want to always preface this and also I want to just do a shout out here to say Robin Huffman is in the house and she is also my wildlife rehabilitator kin. Um, she takes care of uh, injured orphan primates who are affected by the bushmeat trade in Africa and I'm super inspired by her so I just want to say that. Um, but she knows and you know if any of you do wildlife rehabilitation you'll know that the goal is not to keep these animals as pets. As cute as they can be, as lovable as they seem, and you know, we do have a connection obviously because we are animals and wildlife are also living beings. So it's possible to connect with them, but we don't need to keep them as pets. Um, that's actually very detrimental to their well-being. So I would say that if you like animals and you have a good heart and you understand um, their needs, then you can definitely be a wildlife rehabilitator. There's no four-year degree or anything that you need to, to do that other than those, those parameters. So. Why do animals need rehabilitation? Well, a lot of these issues are caused by people. Um, so we have unnecessary human intervention. I call this cute baby syndrome. So you're walking down the street with your dog and you see a baby bird hopping around and you think, oh my goodness, this bird is in need of its parents. I don't know what's going on. It's so cute and it's so helpless looking. Let me help this animal. Um, so maybe you pick it up and you say, here, wildlife rehabilitator, please help me. Uh, I have a baby animal and the wildlife rehabilitator might say, that bird is not in need of help. Um, yes, it's a baby, but it's a fledgling. So it's on its way to be an adult. You know, just like, you know, human children grow up, animals grow up too. And there are different stages where they might need critical care. And there are other stages where they're kind of learning to fend for themselves. Um, I would say in most cases, it's best to actually leave animals outside um, unless, you know, for the uh, causes I'll, I'll outline below, um, a lot of animals just need to learn how to be animals. And it's totally fine if they mess up uh, in some cases, they're quite resilient. So we don't want to be picking up baby animals who are just learning to be animals. So that's a key thing to remember. Um, poisoning, I've seen quite a lot of, um, so especially by schools and golf courses, hotels, um, a lot of rat poisoning can hurt um, birds of prey because the birds of prey, talking about hawks, owls, falcons, they'll dive in, they'll eat a rat or a mouse that's been poisoned, they'll become poisoned. Um, pesticides, uh, flea and tick sprays, all different things that you might be putting on your lawn uh, to kill off grubs or other creatures, it, it could really have a bad effect on all the wildlife in your area. So you want to be very careful of that. Um, but that's something that we often will treat. Uh, I also want to mention lead poisoning is another big one in that realm. Habitat destruction. So we build our human structures and houses and developments. Um, and while we do that, we destroy the living areas of wild creatures. And that can be enormously detrimental, especially to small local populations of animals. Um, so I've seen tons of animals for that reason. Uh, quite often it's because 
you know, someone wanted to cut down a tree and then there were a bunch of squirrels or owls living in that tree. Um, so we really have to start thinking of wildlife as having homes in nature and we need to be more conscious of, of what we're doing. That's a big takeaway I have from my work. Um, entrapment entanglement. So, you know, if you see plastic, pick it up, please, because animals are constantly getting entangled in uh, plastic stuff. And I've spent the last four years of my life working on a sto um, stories about plastic, and I just finished a book about that issue, and it's insidious. So that's a, a major reason that we see um, wildlife in need of help. Commonly also, if you have a soccer net up in the backyard, um, animals can get caught in that. If you have different types of decorations in your yard, um, including now we're past Halloween time, but putting up the spider web stuff. Um, I got a lot of calls this year of birds being caught in that. Um, so we have to just think about that when we're living our human lives. I've seen injuries from humans or other animals. Um, I want to say luckily the abuse situations I've seen, like humans abusing wildlife, has been very, very low, uh, which is really good. But unfortunately, people put their you know, let their dogs or cats out and aren't conscious that maybe those uh, domestic animals might be harming wildlife. So we need to be, keep our eyes on that. Um, illness, just like us, wildlife gets sick. We know that from COVID-19, um, but there are all sorts of diseases that animals can get. I want to tell you so that you don't feel scared. Yes, be careful about um, diseases that can transmit between humans and animals, um, but if you handle wildlife wearing gloves, um, you know, if you have a mask now, you should wear it. Um, but the likelihood of you getting sick from helping a wild animal is small, except for a few rare cases. Um, so that's something that we also keep an eye on. Orphaning in nature, nature can be very cruel. Uh, there are constantly animals, baby animals that don't make it. Um, of course, if we find a baby animal that's in need of care, we, we help it and try to bring it to adulthood. Um, but it's a fact of life that not all of them will make it. So that's a, a big, big one that we see often. Um, and like I said, the abuse is not quite, it's not very uh, rampant, but it does happen. So keep an eye out for that if you're looking to rehabil rehabilitate animals. Um, I want to reiterate this too. This is Rocky, rest in peace. Uh, she was my childhood cat and she only had one eye and she always wanted to go outside. So in her very old age, my brother would take her in the backyard and sit with her and she couldn't catch or kill any animals. Um, but letting your cats go free range outside, um, it's a recipe for disaster. There are billions of not just birds, but also bats I've seen, um, chipmunks, squirrels, rabbits, uh, they're all the lizards even. I've seen cats killing them. So we have huge loss of wildlife um, just from cats alone. Like, like I said, billions of animals. So just try to contextualize that, but it's just, it's so bad. And you would solve the, we could solve the problem by keeping our cats inside. Of course, cats enjoy being out outdoors. So you can try a leash um, or doing supervised time like I did, my brother did with Rocky, um, or even make a catio, which is like a little patio for cats. So I think that's a good compromise. Um, if you care about wildlife, but you also care about your cat, you can find a way to make it work. Um, so once you kind of have it in your mind that, okay, I want to be a wildlife rehabilitator, um, you're going to have to start training to be one. So you will contact your State Department of Environmental Conservation in Connecticut. That's the DEEP. Um, I'm licensed by the DEC, which is a New York State um, licensing unit, and you will have to read the Code of Ethics and also read about um, what you need to know to pass the Wildlife Rehabilitator License exam. So I think I spent, I was 16 when I got my license, so I spent um, maybe six months studying. I really tried to like reflect on why I wanted to do this because I think that anyone who goes into wildlife rehabil rehabilitation really needs to understand that this is a huge responsibility. You're putting yourself uh, in charge of caring for other lives and it's not easy. You see a lot of death, you see a lot of creatures that don't make it. Um, it can be dangerous. I've been bitten and kicked and scratched more times than I can count. <laughs> um, all I have to do is look at my hands and see all the scars from the baby squirrels and the hawks and stuff. And it's just like, 
it's it's difficult work so I'm not trying to deter you but you have to be I think you should always be very serious about this kind of work because um, it is a large responsibility and the ethics here um, I just reading them I always whenever I refer back to them I reflect on why I'm doing this why I'm doing what I'm doing um, you know I need to know that you know different licenses have different rules so you know if you go into this you can't just pick up any animal that you want um, there are different rules for deer for raccoons um, for migratory birds because there are lots of different laws that are protecting these animals um, so you need to be well versed in also the legal aspects of this as well as the medical and ethical aspects so it's it's serious business um, although we often do this as Robin can probably relate we, of, we often do this as volunteers um, or don't get paid very much for our work but it is critical work and I think that um, as you saw with all these causes for why animals need real rehabilitation you'll notice that virtually all of these besides maybe um, natural cases of illness or injuries from other wildlife say a hawk was trying to catch a squirrel and they injured the squirrel but the squirrel survived um, humans have caused all these issues so you're going into this um, you need to feel motivated to kind of right these wrongs um, and really reflect on your values of why you're doing this um, just be serious about it you can get into lots of trouble for doing the wrong thing so pay attention to the fine print <laughs> That's my lesson from that. Um, now I'm just gonna run through a few case studies from my own life, um, just so you can kind of get a taste of what it's like if you're not familiar with what it's like to be a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, so my first tale is about Cortez and Santana the squirrels. They are named thusly because there was uh, music on the radio. We had some Neil Young and some Santana um, in the car when I went to go rescue these two babies. So a woman called me um, I live on Long Island, by the way, right now, soon to be in Connecticut, but I have my, uh, once you're licensed, you have your name and number on a state list of rehabilitators. So people can just call you up and say, hi, I know that you're in my area. Can you please help me with this animal? So I've been doing that for the past 11, now almost 12 years. Um, and so people just call me up. So I got a call a few years ago, two baby squirrels. A woman had a tree cut in her yard um, little did she know there was a squirrel nest in the top of it. The nest came toppling down the mother squirrel and one of the babies passed away, uh, unfortunately, but there were two that were still alive, um, Cortez and Santana. So I picked them up. They were absolutely riddled with fleas. Um, it was not a nice situation. <laughs> so I had them and I go, okay, now I got to raise these two baby squirrels. So once I combed all of the fleas out of their fur, which took hours, um, and then I also have a secret tip here. Um, if you use a very, very dilute tea tree oil solution, it like makes the fleas jump off of the animal's fur. You want to be very careful though, because it can be toxic if you use too much of it, but a very dilute amount of it can be very wonderful for eradicating fleas <laughs> in a natural way. Um, so once I did that, I warmed the babies up and then I hydrated them by giving them some fluids, um, just Pedialyte, and I warmed it up and gave it to them uh, in their mouth. They drank it up, all good. Once they were hydrated, I started preparing formula. So what do you feed a baby squirrel if they're still supposed to be nursing their mother? Well, I gave these orphans a uh, puppy milk replacement, and that is kind of the, uh, the standard for squirrels. It's different for all different baby animals, but that's what you feed them. I fed them several times a day. They got bigger and more energetic and I was getting so excited because I'm like, okay, they're almost on their way out. Um, and when you're a wildlife rehabilitator and you're licensed and not working in a clinic, um, another consideration is where will you keep your patients? <laughs> For me, sometimes it was in my bathroom. Sometimes it was in my <laughs> apartment uh, in the kitchen. I mean, you have to make it work for you. Um, there are no real hard rules for this, uh, as long as animals have adequate space to be animals um, before they're released to the wild. So my friends always got a kick out of this when I came over, when they came over my, my place and I would tell them, Shh, I have baby squirrels in my bathroom. And then I would make them go use 
<laughs> like a bathroom at my friend's house next door just because I had squirrels in there. It was quite funny. Um, once the squirrels got big enough, um, you know, there are different standards. So if you find babies, um, they're going to be a certain age. So say they're a few weeks, they need to be um, given milk and then they're weaned off and then they're eating solid food for a certain amount of time. It really depends when you find them, what condition they're in. Um, and so once they were ready to go, I did a soft release. So I had a big cage in the backyard um, and then I took them to a local park and I released them. And there, they were just stuck around. I mean, um, so the park was near my mom's house. Uh, she's on Long Island. And they, they kept coming back to the house. And I am very tough about um, making sure that I don't impress myself on these animals. So I don't want them to come to me to say, oh, that girl has food. Like, that, that's a recipe for disaster. Because like I said, humans are usually the cause of problems for wildlife. So the more afraid and the more they dislike me, the better. They don't, <laughs> I want them to have nothing to do with me. Yet they did know where their old cage was. So they used to go to their old cage where I soft released them near this park. Um, and so they did come back for a while, but they went to live happy lives as squirrels. And I, you know, I saw them for years. It was quite amazing. Um, so that was a very positive story. I'm starting with the, the good stories. Um, <laughs> so the second tale is Sooty the Great Horned Owl. So I'm giving them all names just to make them a little bit more personable to you. Um, so I got another call again a few years ago on Long Island um, and a woman said, I think there is an owl in my chimney. And I said, okay, this is an interesting call to get. So I jump in my car. I have uh, two sets of heavy gloves that I put on um, because hawks and owls and falcons, their feet, um, the claws on their feet, they're called talons. They are extremely sharp. Um, and also the muscles in these birds of prey, their feet are really strong. I mean, they can like have a crushing grip almost. Um, and that's their weapon. It's not really their beak usually, it's more of their feet. So if you're rehabilitating wild birds um, and birds of prey specifically, which you need a federal license to do that, but if you're state licensed, you can keep them 24 hours to give care. So that's what I did in this case. Um, they will, if they're scared, um, a bird of prey, they'll kind of rear up with their feet like this and they'll kind of lunge at you. So you have to be super careful. I brought a towel, I brought the gloves, a crate, um, and I covered the owl with a towel. And then I put the owl in what is known as a rehab hold. So as I said, like these feet are powerful. These are the, the owl's weapons. And this is a great horned owl, by the way. Um, grab around the ankles, secure um, with my elbows, the wings in so they can't flap around and the owl won't get injured. Um, and I kept this owl's head covered uh, while I did the exam. Um, so what is an exam on a wild animal? Well, you think of if you go to the doctor and get a physical, you're checking kind of, you know, the basic signs that everything's all right. <laughs> you're not looking for anything specifically, you're just doing a, a checkup kind of thing. Um, so it's different for every animal, but if you're taking care of a bird, you find a bird that needs help, you'll check to see, are they hydrated? So you open their beak um, and you check to see if, you know, is there moisture in there? Is it pink in their mouth? Um, are their eyes working correctly? You know, are they blinking? Because I didn't really know what had happened when this owl had fallen down this woman's chimney. Um, it could have gotten really banged up, but it turns out he was totally fine, his wings were fine, um, the feet, his feet were working great. So I just had to release him. It was a very, very simple rescue. Um, he hadn't been in the chimney very long. So I dropped the towel and I let him go and there was a lot of soot that <laughs> rained down on me, um, but it was a great successful release. So those moments, like if you get started in wildlife rehabilitation, I live for those moments. Those are the best. It's really so fulfilling. Um, so he just took off. I'm going to be telling a more grim story. It's nothing graphic, but it's very not very happy. So I'm just trigger warning there. Uh, this is Red, the red tailed hawk. Um, I got a call from Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and this woman said, I see this red tailed hawk. He's very lethargic. He's laying under a bush. So I go out there with my towels and my gloves and my crate. 
Um, and this poor hawk was just very disoriented. And you can see that his um, beak is ajar. So there's me and the hawk. Um, turns out that he was poisoned. Um, and I could just see the deterioration. Uh, his eyes, like the pupils were dilated. Um, his mouth was ajar and I brought him to a veterinary clinic where they did a toxicology workup and it turns out that he was poisoned by rat poison. So this was a clear case where he had definitely eaten a rat or a mouse, um, a rodent of some sort. And I realized, okay, this was in Cold Spring Harbor by a golf course, putting the pieces together. And again, this pattern, I've seen it so many times. Um, we really have to be more conscious of what we're doing like in with within the food chain because you know you might not think okay I don't want to hurt a hawk but I don't want rats in my golf course but if you poison the rats you might end up killing the hawks so we have to think really big picture um, I often found it easier as kind of someone who cared about conservation to think that way but not everyone thinks that way and the more that we educate people about these issues so for example if you know a neighbor who's using pesticides or poison on their lawn or throughout their house. Um, even if you're not a rehabilitator, just telling people to remember these things and to try to find another way because it can really deplete populations of wildlife. Um, I mean, we saw this with DDT way back in the day before DDT was banned. Um, DDT is a pesticide, so it was obviously not meant to harm any other animals except pests uh, which will be what we consider pests, so uh, insects and such. But because DDT was sprayed so free, so prevalently, it got in the environment and it's harmed so many creatures, um, specifically with birds and birds of prey, uh, kestrels and osprey. Um, it really depleted their populations because they weren't able to reproduce. So it didn't just kill them, it also made, made it harder for them to, um, to come back and, and kind of recuperate from, from this depletion. So now I'm getting to another story. This is a baby, this is Hans the baby robin. I was with a Danish friend when we found this robin. Um, so I was out walking in Montauk with a friend and this baby bird was just sitting in the middle of the road. And my friend, he's, he's a tough Danish guy so who's like, oh, you know, it's not gonna make it. This bird's not gonna make it. Uh, it's too small, it just hatched and I said, I think I can do something about that. So I took the baby Robin home. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Took the baby Robin home. Um, I started feeding this Robin a mixture of um, cat food, egg whites, and different vitamins. Um, there are recipes online. We call it Fonz, which is just an abbreviation for I don't even know what. Um, but you feed it this baby bird with syringe almost every 15 minutes for like <laughs> from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, it's wild. So they eat so much. And this poor little robin um, actually made it. So I dropped him off at a wildlife rehabilitation clinic um, once he got a little larger. And they called me one day and said, hey, we just released that baby robin. Um, so when you're rehabilitating wildlife, like I, uh, in the moment, I kept what my friend said in mind. He said, oh, you should probably just end this bird's life because probably will not make it. So we actually do have to make those decisions as wildlife rehabilitators. Um, and you want to consider, do you have the resources? Do you have the time? Is there a good likelihood uh, of a good outcome in this case? Or is it going to prolong an animal's suffering? You want to think about that probably as like your primary uh, consideration, but there are cases where maybe there's just simply, you don't have the tools to, to do what you can do to help this animal. Um, but I always try to save a life rather than end it, obviously. Um, but you want to be well versed in the possibilities um, or kind of what could happen if you do X, what will happen, you know? Um, so I took the chance because it's not really fair to, to get involved in another animal's life um, if you can't help it. So, I mean, sometimes we have to euthanize an animal because it's the what we consider the kinder thing to do. It's never an easy decision by any means. Um, but if there's absolutely no chance that they will make it, sometimes it's better to do that than for you to be force feeding an animal to try to make it survive or, you know, go to great lengths to, to try to do this. Um, 
because it can cause needless suffering. Um, and that's what we want to try to avoid. So again, stick to your values and, and think about the ethics, um, the code of ethics that we reviewed in the beginning, um, because it's not easy to make those decisions. So I took a chance with this baby um, and saved a life, which was nice. Um, so this is Orwell, the Eastern Cottontail. Um, this was a case of a dog attack. So the dog did not attack this baby bunny, but killed its mother and all of his siblings. So uh, I had no other choice but to rehabilitate him uh, when this woman called me. And I also scolded her and said, please don't let your dog kill rabbits because it's not nice. Um, so Orwell came to me and baby rabbits are notoriously difficult to rehabilitate. Um, they are very, very difficult to feed. So if you saw the other photos of the squirrels eating, I'm just going back, here we go. Um, you put a small rubber nipple on the end of a syringe and then they can drink off of that, like as if they were drinking from their mother. But with bunnies, um, they're so skittish and they are very delicate, um, much less hardy than squirrels, I would say. So that we actually have to tube feed them. So we put a tube down their throat. It's a very time consuming process. Um, and again, they have to drink quite a lot when they're very small. So every 30 minutes or so during the day hours. Um, so I did that. And unlike squirrels who drink puppy milk replacement, the rabbits drink kitten milk replacement. So it's just a little small nuance there. But um, if you go online, you can find a lot of these resources for what do wildlife um, that are being rehabilitated need to, to consume in order to be healthy. Because again, I've seen a lot of cases also of people who call me when they've already tried to rehabilitate an animal. So they're just a member of the public who has very little knowledge about how to help, but maybe they've seen that, oh, bunnies, maybe they'll drink goat's milk. I've heard that so many times. And it's like, please don't do that because it's not, it's not actually good for them. Um, it's a lot of misinformation out there. So I would say if, if you are going to do this, um, definitely take your time to study and find the right resources for how to take care of the animals. Because often you'll find, you know, it's not like you're having a cat or a dog and it's simple to take care of them. Uh, this is, these are animals that have, you know, very different needs and what they need is, is out in nature. So it's, it's not always easy to, um, to get that, those needs met. So you want to know exactly what they need before you get them in. So you're not scrambling and saying, oh no, it's midnight on a Monday night and I need kitten milk replacement and I'm going to run to, I don't know where because it, nothing is open and I don't even know where to get that. So I have a few key pet shops and different supply shops that I um, always make sure I stock my, my wildlife rehabilitator closet with. Um, so I have all the supplies at hand. That's really useful. Um, so anyway, with Orwell, I got this baby rabbit. Um, he was just, he was about, let's say close to a month old. Um, and he was almost ready to go. I mean, I was not going to hold on to him very long, but he was still weaning off of milk. So I did tube feeding. Um, he did really well. And then it came time to eat solids. And <laughs> I, I guess when you're a wildlife rehabilitator, you can get humored by these little things. So I, I would go out every morning and just pick some clover from the yard and like just trying to start this little animal's wild life again because imagine how jarring it is to be born in the wild go into the care of a, of a huge giant who's just feeding you things and you don't know where you are <laughs> everything is different um so i really try to make any kind of cage or um enclosure that i have an animal in while they're in my care as natural as possible um, so adding lots of greenery and, and sticks and even pieces of like in, during the season of Christmas, I always try to remind people that when you're done, if you have a live tree um, and as long as it doesn't have any decorations on it, um, wildlife rehabilitation clinics love, love, love when you donate your Christmas tree because they use that in the enclosures um, where they keep their animals that are under their care. So it's really nice. Um, you know, the animals can climb, they can exercise, they can hide. And it's all about kind of reinforcing their ability to be wild because that's the ultimate goal is to return them to the wild. Um, so the more they can hide from people, the more they can climb and stretch out and use their muscles and 
and fly and perch, it's really, really important. Um, and they can actually become injured or sick if you don't give them opportunities to use their, their natural uh, instincts. So that's another thing to consider when you're a wildlife reaver. So Orwell did great. I did another soft release. So this is Orwell getting ready to go. Um, that's some Timothy hay, the clover, the grass. I had sticks, I had towels in there for comfort. Um, so as you can see, this is a lot of DIY. <laughs> but again, I, I wanna reiterate that you need to, to know what you're doing when you do this, but you can easily do it at home. So I definitely encourage you if you love wildlife to, to start being a rehabilitator. So now I'm gonna to get to a point where I'm gonna discuss why we do this. Um, so last year, the UN released a report outlining uh, what has been so many years in the making, but our earth has reached this wild extinction crisis. Um, so basically we are losing species species are going extinct um, at a rate that's never before see, been seen in our recorded history, human history. So there's a direct correlation with the presence of humans on the planet and the loss of all other species of wildlife. Um, and we really risk having a homogenized world where we don't have the beautiful diversity. So you think of all the amazing birds that are migrating through you know, the North or just finished, finishing their migration through the Northeast right now. Um, you know, all different types of plants that go along with animals because the animals can pollinate them or they spread the seeds of different trees and plants. Um, so our whole earth as a system is falling apart right now. Um, and we really need to do something about it. Can wildlife rehabilitation solve this problem? No, I'm the first one to acknowledge that. Um, the reason why I am now a photojournalist as opposed to a full-time wildlife rehabilitator, um, because that was my job for quite a while when I was growing up, um, is that I realized at one point when I was in college that if we don't prevent the problem, the problem will keep happening. So I chose to just have a license so I can still help animals in need, but I professionally would like to use my skills to communicate these issues. Um, you know, any, everything from keeping your cats indoors and the, the toll that that takes on wildlife if you let your cats out to, you know, plastic pollution, especially being the biggest one that I've covered. Um, but all of these actions that we take, uh, dredging the sound, uh, ship traffic, overfishing, there are just so many ways that we're harming wildlife. And I felt like if I wrote about them and documented them in photography, that hopefully I will have to rehabilitate less because, you know, I love it, but I'd rather not see any animals be harmed. So that was why I took that change in direction in my life. Um, but I still find it extremely important and also very valuable to be a wildlife rehabilitator because you will get to know wildlife like very few other people know wildlife. Um, your perception of wildlife might change um, when you see an animal suffering close up and you feel obligated to help it because they are also a living creature, um, just like you and I. So while I find it extremely valuable, I love doing it, um, but it can be heartbreaking if all you're doing is helping an animal, releasing that animal, and then the animal gets sick or injured again, comes back, or the animal just doesn't make it. It's, it's really heartbreaking. So I, I think a huge part of being a wildlife rehabilitator um, is also the education aspect. So if you, you know, if you want to do this, please also realize that it's it's also your obligation to tell others that um, these problems are happening and that we have to change our ways um, in order to really help wildlife because, you know, we're going, we are in a crisis now. It's not down the line, it's happening now. Um, but I think wildlife rehabilitation is a great gateway to being active on these issues and um, trying to change the tide for the best because, yeah, if we don't do something now, we're really going to be in a bad place. Um, yeah, so that's that's my short take on, on this news, but um, it is, it's a big problem and we can't, we can't wait. Um, and I just discussed this why I do it, but that's me with a, a baby owl. Uh, <laughs> 
she was released and she went on to have uh, three babies of her own, which was quite remarkable to watch up close. Um, but I'll say one reason why I didn't rehabilitate, one reason why, wait, I, how do I want to say this? I didn't go into this business of wildlife rehabilitation to make a lot of money because I remember being paid for seven years, $8 an hour before taxes. <laughs> um, I just want to add, it's just such a labor of love. And I know that, you know, Robin, for example, you know that, and many other people that I know also in this field, it's not for the big bucks, it's not for the fame and fortune, it's because you just really care. Um, so that's something else that I'd, I like to highlight is that, yeah, we have to be empathetic towards non-human creatures as well. Um, and I want to say thank you here. This is my baby owl again. Um, if you have any questions at all, if you want to, you know, just kind of pick my brain, uh, if you need advice, if you have an animal and you're not sure what to do with it, this is a short tangent, but one time I was called by someone who asked me, how do you take care of a Galapagos tortoise? And I said, what? <laughs> um, this person knew I was a wildlife rehabilitator and they were watching somebody's pet Galapagos tortoise. That was wild. Um, and yet somehow I knew how to take care of a Galapagos tortoise. So that was wild. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. Um, and you can also find a lot of my wildlife and plastic uh, stories on my website, my photojournalistic stories. Um, and now I want to open up the Q&A. So hope you have lots of questions. 